Hello and welcome to Design Education Talk from the New Art School. Our guest today is Ellen Lupton. Welcome, Ellen. Hi, great to be here. It's great to have you. Fantastic. So tell us about you and your work. I'm a, a writer, a designer, an educator, a former museum curator, an internet personality, <laughs> and a home baker. <laughs> Wow. So I have a lot going on and it all kind of goes together. It all connects because it's all about design yeah. and it's all about communicating design content to all different kinds of people. Amazing. Are, are you doing sourdough too? No, I'm more into ah. cookies, but okay. sourdough okay. is definitely in my future. Yes, yes. I've been looking at gluten-free sourdough myself. It's it's uh, it's quite tricky. There is this, you got to get the measurements accurately. Sort of, mm. um, it's Science, design. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, absolutely. So fantastic. So tell us about what, what you're working on right now. Well, my new book just came out, Thinking with Type, third edition, which is an all-new version of a classic book that I first published in 2004, so 20 years ago. And, of course, the world of design has changed a lot over that period. I've changed a lot. I've learned a lot. The field has got bigger. The field has faced its own biases and limitations. And creating a new edition of this book really meant rethinking every page, rethinking the, some of the concepts and even the voice behind the book to create something that is suitable for our students in our time. That's fantastic. Would you like to say something about how well, to change in terms of design and design education. Yeah, so um, where I teach at, at MICA in Baltimore, a majority of our students are international, and they come from all over the world to study design. And, of course, we're teaching in English, and we're teaching Latin-based typography. And people have come to, to learn that, and many of them hope to work in the U.S., after completing their graduate degree. But nonetheless, they're coming from different language traditions, different typographic traditions, different um, heritages in terms of design and decorative art and the industrialization of the landscape and all of that. Um, so to me, to teach graphic design today, one needs to be a little more open and a little more questioning of how we define and limit the vocabulary of design. So the new edition of Thinking with Type includes brief introductions to a few of the world's writing systems. It is by no means comprehensive, and I, I picked a few that were um, relevant really to, to my teaching and my community. And so that's a, that's a big change. That's like the biggest change in the book. And it doesn't change the emphasis on it as a book dedicated to Latin-based typography. That's what the book is. The native language is English, although it's already coming out in Spanish and Portuguese and will be in Italian next year. And I hope maybe Greek and Russian and all the languages, that would be great. Um, but, but the native language is English. The native script is Latin. And it's a book for learning Latin-based typography. But the earlier editions didn't question that. They simply assumed that this is what typography is. And so a change of perspective and an opening up of the lens of typography today is to say, you know, even if this is our focus, the, the world is actually much bigger. And people coming to graphic design are coming from many different places. And they don't throw away what they know from their own culture. They bring it. And so creating a book that acknowledges that and celebrates it is really important to me in, in my teaching. Absolutely. That, that, that's essential. And also, how, how has the teaching changed itself? I mean, how has the teaching in relationship to how design has changed in 20 years? Ago? <laughs> um, my teaching is very hands-on. And when I first started teaching, 
you know, I was a young intellectual and I loved reading critical theory and Walter Benjamin and <laughs> Michel Foucault and all that sort of stuff. And I thought my students would be interested in that as well. And it turned out they were not as interested <laughs> as I was. And although I still include much of that material in my history and theory classes, in terms of classroom teaching, I really want um, students to have access to methods of making and thinking. And I think that in the 50s and 60s, when design education was kind of invented, you know, post Bauhaus, and you have the Ulm School and the Kunstgewerbe Schule in Basel, you had the invention of methodologies for teaching typography in particular. And by the time I was a student in the 1980s, um, we were really rebelling against that, right? Rebelling against the systems, re rebelling against modernism, rebelling against um, Eurocentric thinking, all of that, you know, it was a whole new world. Um, we called it postmodernism, of course, at that time. And what got kind of lost was um, methods. And I feel like in many design, graphic design, I'm talking about, in many graphic design classrooms, students are just set, told to like, here, go design a brand. Here, here, design a book. Use a grid, design a book. But there isn't like a method and a, a walking through the process. So that's really important to me, even though I teach graduate students. And you would think that graduate students already have a method, but actually they don't. And they're so grateful to experience design in a more um, stretched out over time and kind of step by step, even though then they create their own way of working, which might be much faster. Um, so that, that's been a change in, in, in my teaching. That's great. So tell us how you got into teaching. Well, I was a student, you know. Okay. I, you know, went to art school. I studied design at the Cooper Union in New York. And I had some amazing teachers there, um, a, a, a Czech designer named George Sadek, who was very like, yeah. uh, you know, pure modernist, but also with a Dada touch, you know, because we think of modernism, oh, it's all about function and um, rigid problem solving, communicating an idea without ambiguity. But, you know, modernism always had the Dada side, you know, and we look at Maholi Naj at the Bauhaus. He was also a Dada artist. You know, all these people, they were, they were interested in the, in humor and critique and uh, making fun of society as well as building a new rational world, you know? So when I studied, I had this modernist training, but also, an interest in language and humor and jokes and messing with it. Um, and because I was a postmodernist, you know, at 19 years old, I also needed to question all the projects and question everything, you know, do it my own way. I'm sure I was the most annoying student ever. But I was a student and I loved learning, and I still love learning. I still love taking Skillshare classes and writing classes. <laughs> I've never stopped being a student. But as a young person, I was like, someday I want to teach. And of course, I was so full of myself and so overconfident. I was sure I would teach better. You know, I would bring the unique insights <laughs> of postmodernism to bear upon our discipline. Um, so I just always wanted to be a teacher. I actually became a museum curator first, and that's a different kind of teaching because you are encountering the public and telling stories and explaining things, but it's not in a classroom and it's not intimate and direct. 
it's, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're removed from your student, but it's still teaching. Writing is teaching. Podcasting is teaching. So your, your first uh, contact was in a university was, was where? So when I graduated from Cooper Union, I became yeah. a curator of a small design collection at the school, which has continued to flourish, the Herb Lubalin Study Center. And I was the first curator. And the thing was founded by alumni of my school who loved Herb Lubalin, who was an alumni. And our alum, alumni also included Milton Glaser and Seymour Schwast and many other amazing designers of that generation. Um, and so I became a, a curator at my school and I did some teaching there, some teaching of d graphic design history. Um, but then I went to Cooper Hewitt Museum, which is part of the national museum system of the U.S. It's a little bit like our, our V&A. Yeah. Um, and I became a curator there, which I did for 30 years. Um, and during that time, I started teaching at MICA in 1997 and became a, a proper design educator, capital D, capital E, with students and grades and, you know, semesters and sabbaticals and all the stuff. So quite a, quite a long time ago, but into my career. Yeah. So what would you say the challenge is facing graduates? Uh, what has changed and, w and what challenges are graduates facing right now? Well, I mean, there are many challenges. Um, you know, I think in the U.S., the job market has been disrupted by all those tech layoffs that are now two years ago. Um, I think that really created a lot of um, skittishness and fear in the design industry and kind of slowed down hiring. I think that's been kind of tough. Design thinking as a discipline, uh, which is, you know, more consulting oriented, that's taken a dip and kind of the pullback um, on that. Um, at the same time, there's all kinds of, you know, growth of, you know, digital product design, UX design. So there's lots of opportunities, and I think branding may, remains extremely important and has lots of um, – it isn't just making logos. You know, it's a very big, diverse area. Uh, environmental graphic design is a big area with a lot of opportunity in it because all buildings need signs, <laughs> and that's becoming more interesting, more digital. Yeah. So there's a lot to learn right? and a lot to teach. Absolutely. But what would you, what, what would you say that, that you talk about these challenges, but what has changed in the challenges? I mean, uh, what, what has changed uh, in the challenges the students have been facing? Well, students have to master more and more different uh, tools, but the tools keep changing. So like now um, Figma is such an important um, bridge yeah. and a very flexible, easy, relatively easy tool for people to use. Um, but that's new and that re replaced, you know, other tools that people used to say were the standard and you had to learn. And then uh, tools like Canva, are challenging the supremacy of the Adobe Creative Suite. And the, the cost of the Adobe Creative Suite is a big challenge. Um, our students get access to that software as students, yeah. but then it's shocking if you have to pay for it yourself. And I've actually met alums who said that they left the field because they couldn't afford the software which is really crazy if you're like an independent person and Aren't trying they, to start out to, as a to, designer. To platform like Procreate. I guess they could, but in terms of like software for really publishing and yeah. doing multi-page, you know, yeah. documents and having access to all the fonts, you know, it's still an ecosystem yeah. that's pretty important to how design is um, practiced in the world. 
Um, so, so there's, you know, uh, there's always like new things to learn. <laughs> and I think one of the things that, that stays consistent is the principles of visual design. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you take a UX boot camp, you know, this does not make you a visual designer. It's like very difficult to learn how to work with type and color and form and narrative and storytelling and the relationship between language and layout. You know, that's very tough. And that stuff doesn't change that much. Yeah, you know, there's different trends and styles, but there's a lot of continuity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So... What are the limitations you're facing in your teaching? Well, I don't know all the new technologies, you know. <laughs> so in my teaching, I focus on the content, the message, the storytelling, the typography, you know, creating ways in to typography for my students that are methodological. Um, I teach design history and design theory, where there the, the challenge is like opening up the discourse to decolonizing design, inclusive design, um, feminism and queer aesthetics in design, things that were just not mentioned <laughs> when I was a student. It was like there were certain things you had to know and they were all like the modernism yeah, and not these, you know, not, not opening it up. Um, so as a graduate level faculty member, I'm responsible for delivering that bigger discourse about design to students and engaging them in reading and critical thinking about the field, as well as helping them with their independent research and with learning some of the basics of, of graphic design. But I'm not teaching them Figma. Of course. No, of course, of course. I'm <laughs> it's just not going to be my thing. You know? I'm talking more about limitations that, you know, for example, if, if you could do anything, you know, if you had the magic wand, would you change anything in design? I would education? make it free. You would make it free. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. That's... You know, which, you know, Europe is way ahead with that. But not if you're an immigrant. You know, so like people, oh, everything's free in Europe. Well, only if you're a certain kind of citizen. And um, in the U.S., it's so privatized and it's so expensive and it um, is really not good. And we do have a public education system yeah. with very good universities, but they're still very expensive. Yeah. Um, so that that's the biggest limitation and how to pay for it is not answered. You know, we don't know how to do that. Absolutely. I, I'm mm -hmm. more talking as well about structures or about, you know, anything in the, in the way we're doing it, how we're delivering it, <laughs> those limitations. Um, well, again, I teach in a graduate program yeah. and we have a lot of time to spend with our students. And I don't know how graduate courses are, are run in the UK or in Europe, but um, at, at my school, it's very intimate. So we have, you know, a limited number of students in each class, you know, 18 to 22 for the whole graduating group. And we get to really work with them one-on-one -on -one a lot and in groups, you know, as, as a class. And that is really wonderful. We don't say, here's a room, go make some graphic design. It's very structured. Um, and I'm very happy with that. Um, we're, we're, our students are graduating next week. And I've had so many of our graduates come up to me and say, this is the best thing I ever did. This is the best experience I've ever had. I, I feel like I didn't know anything when I look back at who I was two years ago, I didn't know anything, and now I know. So that's pretty exciting. Absolutely. And that's a kind of teaching that requires spending a lot of time with your students, of you course. know, of which course. is expensive, right? It's, like, <laughs> it's you can't do that with 500 people. You can't do that. No, online. I mean, I mean, I mean, graphics, uh, visual communication classes have always been small. And and they are and there are small. Um, well, of course, depending on the university. <laughs> our schools want them to be bigger. Yeah, you know, get more people in there, 
and it it doesn't work, you know. Absolutely, because then you don't have the time. Then you, if you divide yeah, the time, you don't person. get to see anybody. Yeah. And what do you think the challenges are? <laughs> you seem to be driving at a at an answer, so I'm curious. No, no, no. I'm think. not driving at any answer. I'm, I'm just ho- I'm just trying to build. Uh, if we could build the ideal school. You know, of course, uh, free is, is free is very important, but but of course, you know, even the Bauhaus was not free when it when it started. Uh, so no, it certainly wasn't exactly. So I'm saying that if you had like if you could build the ideal school without any limitations, would you what would you change in the structures? <laughs> I'm not driving at any answers. It's just it's just all yeah, about what would I change? removing the limitations. I mean, I think of the limitations in my own. Program. I wish there was more like open space for building things. And, you know, we often think of design as something happening at a desk. You're at a desk. I'm at a desk. <laughs> right. And it's very limiting. So rethinking, um, you know, a more Bauhaus idea of like a big workshop where people are making stuff a big kitchen and you can be cooking and baking. <laughs> that would be really cool, you know, yeah. um, to be able to involve the community more would be interesting. I don't know quite how you would do that, but to make um, design programs somehow more permeable to people, less of a, a barrier. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, it's always interesting in various countries uh, how good design is applied at a more universal level. Because some countries, you know, we only see, for example, good design in the schools or in the exhibitions, but we don't see it in the products anymore. We don't see it in the... Mm-hmm. Some countries you go and, and they do have it. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, you go to the Netherlands and everything is yeah. beautiful. But so, they have no yeah. place to live. They have a housing <laughs> crisis. <laughs> So there is a big design problem. It's right? interesting how to democratize this more because because mm-hmm. you know okay we can be getting into the buildings and seeing the beautiful design, but but it's only for us where it should be for everyone. It's always it's mm-hmm. always been that that good design should be for everyone and everyone should ex- be exposed to it. Fantastic. So how can our viewers and listeners find you? Um, I'm on Instagram at Ellen Lupton. And I have a lot of fun there doing little design lessons um, involving cookies and cakes and things in my house. So that's kind of fun. So follow me at Ellen Lupton. And of course, my books are available wherever books are sold, including my new book, Thinking with Type, third edition. But some of my other books are evergreen. Um, My book on design is storytelling, which came out in 2017 still really sells a lot of copies and has been translated into many languages or graphic design, the new basics still in print, still very successful. A lot of these books are used as textbooks, which I'm really proud of. And sometimes it's just the faculty member has it. That's cool. Like however we can get the message out is, is fun. It's absolutely true. So what advice would you like to leave us with? Anything we haven't sort of told. For teachers? For teachers, for students. For For teachers, you know, one of the things that I learned is that you should always do the project. Like when I first started teaching, I came up with these sort of theoretical uh, design briefs for my students. And I wasn't really clear what I thought they would make. Like I had something in my mind, but I had nothing to show them. Like, here's what, here's where we're headed. Um, And I didn't understand how someone would do the project. So when you're creating a new project for your students, I think it's really important to actually try it yourself and to understand what, (laughs) does it actually work, you know? Um, I find it really useful to show students examples of other student work. So if you develop a project over time, you can really improve it. I feel that the the new generation, especially, they really want to know like what's expected of them. They want to know how to do it. 
And so showing people examples is really helpful. And the other thing is like developing a vocabulary for talking about the work <laughs> that is concrete and objective. And that's really challenging. So building into a project like criteria for success so that when we talk about it, it isn't um, vague and unclear to students how to succeed and how to improve their work. It's kind of old school. You know? It's not very postmodern. You know, it's more like, here, we're learning how to do something. Yeah. Fantastic. What about your advice to students? Well, to be curious, you know, it's just so easy to go on Pinterest or on Instagram and see all the things that other designers are doing. So to be curious about history, to look at things that were created 50 years ago or in another culture, you know, go to museums, watch movies, look for inspiration not just in like the latest piece of graphic design. Curiosity, it's hard to be curious when you feel really stressed just to make something that looks good. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, I loved and, it. Uh, keep in touch with the podcast and hopefully see you soon. Yeah, I love it. Take Thanks care. so much for the take conversation. Bye-bye. Bye.